Welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle, your co-host and the head witch in charge here at Holisticism. Delighted to have you. Welcome back to the squirrels who have been here before, to our new squirrels. Hi, how's it going? The 12th House Podcast is a little corner of the internet where we bring together creativity, inspiration, intuition, spiritual shit, the metaphysical, the practical, tactical stuff that comes to running a business. And we bring it to you so that you can do your sacred work, so you can self-actualize, so you can be the biggest you you could possibly be. It's really fun. You're going to like it, I think. So anyway, let's get into today's episode. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm feeling excited about today's concept because it's one that we've alluded to a lot at Holisticism, and it's like one of my favorite things to review for myself, and I'm just excited to talk about it. How are you? Yeah, I'm feeling excited, nervous anxious because today we're talking about 15 cognitive distortions that influence your day-to-day lived experience and reality. And these come from the school of cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, I think so. I'm, I was introduced to them by my therapist uh, many years ago. And you know how when you go to college and you tell your friend something about like what your family did growing up and they're like, that's not normal. Or like, oh yeah, when I was in Catholic school, we had to go to confession and like confess our sins to the priest. And people are like, that's a bit weird. You know, like, I don't know about that. I feel like that's what the 15 styles of cognitive distortions are. It's like, Hey, this thing that you do that you think everyone else does, not everyone else does it. And in fact, it might not be helping you, which is kind of like, you know, jarring in a way. Absolutely. I think the thing, though, about these distortions is that they're sneaky, they're tricky, and you will trick yourself into being like, I don't do that. I never do that. I never overgeneralize. I never catastrophize. Mm -mm, Not me. But then once you read through them and hear the examples, you're like, oh, Turns out I'm the problem. <laughs> that may, in fact, be me. Totally. Yeah. And and I've found that I hit all of these styles of cognitive distortions. And that's okay. Because at least for me, I know my baseline is never going to be like normal chill. Like I'm not a chill girl. I'm always going to be like my baseline is catastrophizing, right? Where I'm like, well, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Mm. I think that's going to happen. And I kind of have to like pull myself back from the ledge and be like, wait, 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 let's dial it down to like a five from like 3000. And let's just come back to maybe a more neutral place. And I think that that's like sometimes all you can do. It's not to totally retrain yourself to think, to not have these things, right? It's just to notice like, oh, I'm doing that. Just like with any framework or mental model understanding your thoughts, like the lens through which your thoughts are metabolized in your own, I don't know, like self-concept. Yeah. And we are not psychotherapists and therapists here. We are not mental health experts. (laughs) (laughs) No. And we are not giving you advice. We are just sharing our experience of using cognitive distortions as a really helpful way to have some checks and balances in your life. Amen. Honestly, you guys will put the link to a really great infographic for all these cognitive distortions. I like screenshot this and have it favorited on my photos so that I can go back to it. So we'll include the link, but let's go through them and then we'll pick our greatest hits, the cognitive distortions that we go to on the most regular basis. Let's start at the very beginning with polarized thinking or all or nothing thinking, black or white thinking, either or thinking. When you have polarized thinking, you there's no nuance, right? Uh, you either have to be like uh, absolutely perfect or you're an, that means you're an abject failure if you're not. There's no middle ground for someone that has either or thinking. So like an example would be if I don't get this job, then I'm going to like I'm going to die because I'm not going to make any money and I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to be out on the street and I know that I'm not going to be able to, like, I can't live on the street. I can barely live in an apartment in a city. And then I'm just going to, I don't know, I'm just going to cease to exist. Like, that is a couple styles of thinking. It's also catastrophizing. But another example of either or thinking might be like, oh, if this person doesn't say that they love me back, then, like, we have to break up as opposed to, okay, we're dating. They might not be ready to say I love you yet, but that doesn't mean that like I need to throw the entire relationship away. 
I like those examples. I think often it's easier to default into like a binary black and white thought pattern because it feels safe to a degree. So we all know what that feels like when it's like, okay, well, so-and-so didn't text me back. We are no longer friends. They're voted off the island or whatever. Meanwhile, you never know what's happening in their life, what they're going through. Hopefully that's not your polarized habit, but it happens to the best of us where you you can just catch yourself being like, wait a second, what is the whole picture here? Nothing is black and white as it seems on the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that also like black or white thinking. And I think a lot of these cognitive distortions are a little bit like shortcuts. Like they really, it's almost like your Mm -hmm. brain is like a rock skipping on, on the surface of the lake, but like you're missing some really important steps when you skip. And that's kind of like a, what a heuristic is too. Heuristics are like shortcuts for your brain. And sometimes they're really helpful because they help us analyze something more quickly and get to a determination more quickly. But sometimes they're not helpful. You know, there's nuance there. It's not either or. And I think that like, that's a key thing for me because I often have either or thinking as like a perfectionist person, as someone with ADHD. It's when I'm thinking way too fast because I just think in the extremes. It's almost like I'm like ping ponging from one extreme to the other. And when I slow down, I start to find solutions. And I also notice that like when I get sort of like stuck in that really fast spiral, I keep going from like, yes to no, black to white, either or. I need to almost like get out of my box, sort of like interrupt the pattern for myself of how I'm thinking. And for me, that looks like go exercise or go do some art, (laughs) you know, like go do an art project or like go bake or cook or something like that. Do you struggle with either or thinking? Absolutely. All the time. (laughs) (laughs) I was just thinking I'm traveling tomorrow for a wedding And I feel the most black or white thinking crop up in an almost comical way that I really have to walk myself back from when I'm traveling. It's always like, if I don't get this shirt, my trip will be ruined. (laughs) I need this specific shirt. Or I have to go buy all new toiletries, like random stuff where once I actually start packing or look at my things, I'm like, oh, I'm, I really just needed to start packing. That's really what I'm feeling is unprepared. And it's very subconscious. I'm not actively thinking these things, but I'm almost placing my to-do list in the extreme of I have to do this or else I won't feel good getting on the plane. But it's really because ultimately at the root of it, the thought is you will be unhappy. The trip will not feel good if you don't do X, Y, Z. So it can be very sneaky, but just build in a way that causes so much anxiety. So, you know, everyone feels that before a trip. But I have found the more that I'm able to kind of, to your point, do something with my hands, like actually just start packing, lay things out. I often realize, okay, maybe I need one trip to get toiletries, but I don't really like need to get anything else. I don't need to buy out the Sephora, you know? I yeah. Mean, I might want to, but I don't need to. Yeah. I really just need to go to the mini section for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put on a timer. Kind of leads into the next one, which is mental filtering. There's two types of mental filtering. One where we solely focus on a negative experience or aspects of a negative experience. Um, negative aspects of an experience or when we only fo- <laughs> when we disqualify the positive. So we notice the good things that come up, but we don't count them towards anything. So negative filtering might be like when someone gives you feedback and they give you one good point of feedback and then they give you like something, an area of improvement, your negative filtering only thinks about that negative thing that comes up. That's like We all have negativity bias, our brains naturally, and that's kind of what negative filtering is. And then um, ignoring the positive is like, let's say like you get a promotion above everyone else in on your team instead of being like, yeah, hell yeah, I got that promotion. Like that must mean that I'm doing some good work. You'd be like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's like that it doesn't really matter. I'm not that good. Or the only reason they gave me the promotion is because they've been there the longest. Or the only reason they gave me a promotion is is because I'm a Virgo. Or the only reason they gave me a promotion is because I'm the only woman on the team. So you disqualify the actual like earning that you've done, the capabilities that you've done. I think women do that a lot. There is something about foreboding joy 
that happens in relationship to mental filtering because you feel that if you're not looking for what could go wrong, then you're not being responsible. When people are like, well, prepare for the worst, but expect the best. We've talked about that on this podcast. Yeah. You can just get wrapped up in just constantly preparing for the worst. So your filter is always looking for the catastrophe that's on the way. This also reminds me of like of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule and how, you know, one concept is 20% of our day is going to be amazing, but 80% of our day is going to be kind of objectively sucky. And when you are ignoring the positive or disqualifying the positive, then you're basically saying like, yeah, that 20% link doesn't really matter. The 80% is what matters as opposed to if we're really like employing that principle, understanding that, yeah, that 20%, like that's where the marrow of life comes from. That's like my reason to continue on. I need to like enjoy that and count it as a win. A win is a win, as they say. Um, but that can be really hard, I think, especially for competitive people. Because when you're in competition, you kind of can't like stop to celebrate your success. You have to kind of just like keep putting your head down and be like, cool, got that. What's the next thing? And um, I think a lot of us wake up. Well, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I have noticed that a lot of people that we work with wake up in their 30s and they're like, I haven't really like experienced happiness or like satisfaction from my job or from the work that I do, even though I'm a really high achiever, even though I make a ton of money because I'm always moving the goalpost. And this sucks. <laughs> and I think that that's one of these cognitive, one of these cognitive distortions at play all the time. One of the things that I think it comes up for me the most, I was thinking this while you were describing it is in relationships. Mm. It comes up as there's a name for it when you're like keeping score between in romantic relationships mm -hmm. where people are like, well, I did this and I did that. Well, you're not recognizing me for this or that. Mm -hmm. Or the other person, let's say, is working on one part of the relationship. And I'll just use me as an example. I've definitely been in the position where I just continue to move the goalpost in the relationship and be like, well, now you have to work on this mm -hmm. or now this is bothering me. And it can feel on either end, really demoralizing if you're continuously just focusing on what needs to be improved. So I feel like a lot of the time in couples therapy, it's a lot about let's start appreciating what you like that the partner is already doing. Mm -hmm. Well said. And that gratitude list. God damn it. <laughs> Super gratitude list. Next one, overgeneralization. Overgeneralization is kind of similar, I think, to either or thinking, but it's when you have a blanket statement around like one data point that you have, you like create an entire world around it. So that one piece of evidence creates uh, a, a whole way of thinking. For example, you have one bad green smoothie and you're like, all green juices are actually the vomit of Satan and no one should drink them. That's like a massive overgeneralization. But of course we do that with lots of things like people or spirituality or work or dating. It happens all the time. All wheatgrass shots should be banned <laughs> from all juice cafes. <laughs> that is an overgeneralization I stand by. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Overgeneralizations, sometimes they're funny. They're pretty funny. <laughs> Exactly. It's so similar to stereotypes and we should not be using them, but are often used in comedy because it's in a way of making a larger point. Yeah, it's an extreme and extremes are what's what is funny. Yeah. And also overgeneralizations come up a lot. And when we coach people, when they're like, well, that's never going to work for me because I did this one thing one time. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, oh, spirituality will never work for me. Like that's so stupid because they went to church as a young person and it didn't resonate with them. Um, that doesn't mean like you probably are actually spiritual. You just don't necessarily have the language to describe it for yourself. Well said. Next one, jumping to conclusions. There's two examples of jumping to conclusions that I actually think in the intuitive and spiritual community come up a lot. The first one is mind reading. And this is when we assume that we know what the other person's thinking. I noticed that I did a lot of mind reading when I was dating someone who was a narcissist. So I was really trying to like figure out what they wanted and what they wanted me to do. And I would automatically ascribe a thought pattern to them. 
The second example is fortune telling. And that's kind of similar to mind reading, but basically you make a prediction based on little to no evidence. Um, and usually the prediction is negative. So you have an interview for a job and you assume it's going to go badly because you're bad at making first impressions. Then hello, you basically create the context for that experience to probably go badly. You kind of psych yourself out and then it usually happens. Yeah, it's like confirmation bias mm -hmm. to a degree. But the mind reading one, I think, is really tricky to your point with if you're very close with someone who has a certain type of personality disorder, like narcissism or BPD. Or addiction. Yes. That's not a true. personality disorder. But. The squirrels get it. <laughs> I think if you're a highly, let's say, people-pleasing, oriented, or empathetic person who has been with somebody on the spectrum of narcissism, or somebody who was very unpredictable in terms of communicating their needs, their emotions. You get very adept at trying to interpret moods and guess moods. And then sometimes you can think, because that's what you're trying to do for so long, you are good at it. And that that is how you should act with everyone. I definitely have been in the habit of this, of being like, I know what they were really thinking, but they said so and so. And that gets you really into trouble very quickly, mm -hmm. especially when you think, I don't know, I've come back around to really just taking people at their word mm -hmm. and lending them the benefit of the doubt in actually your words until they prove me wrong, then I can take that <laughs> benefit back. But ultimately, you have to trust people at their word. It's their work to be able to actually communicate what it is that they're feeling. You don't need to be a mind reader. It doesn't work anyway. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a really hard lesson for me to learn of like, I can't like try to have precognition around what someone's actions are going to be. Like that's just another way of controlling someone is preemptively deciding how they're going to respond to how I am. And that's not fair because it doesn't give the person any other way to be other than how I've decided they should be or how I think that they are. And that doesn't hold space for both the highest version of that person and maybe like the shadowy side of that person, both of which are lovable. And if I'm truly in relationship with them, I should have the capacity to hold. And it's still hard. <laughs> it's still really hard to be like, Ugh, I don't want this person to be mad at me. So I'm going to say this because I don't want them to respond in this way. I noticed that a lot. Like, oh, I don't want to like have that conversation. So let me like mince my words or blah, blah, blah. And we've talked about, I think, ask versus guess culture before on the podcast. And I think that that comes up here. Like, oh, I'm going to like guess what I think that they'll say, um, which can, can come out as passive aggressive aggressivity versus like, let me just ask you, what do you actually think about this? Or did, sorry, did that hurt your feelings? Or how are you interpreting that? Are you all good? And giving them an option to tell you what's coming up. Brava, brava. <laughs> I'm like... No notes. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> all right, number five. How about we just say all of them, and then we'll pick our favorites. <laughs> yes, okay. So five is catastrophizing, which is magnification and minimization. Six is personalization. Seven is blaming, blaming other people. Eight is labeling, which is an extreme form of overgeneralization. Nine is always being right. <laughs> that one hurts. <laughs> um, ten is should statements, actually, which I think a lot of the people who listen to this podcast probably know, um, but that's a distorted style of thinking. Emotional reasoning is number 11. Number 12 is control fallacies the external control fallacy and the internal control fallacy. External control is that it's a belief that your life has been completely controlled by external factors and fate has, your fate has already been deci decided. Internal control is the belief that you have complete control of yourself and your own surroundings. Oh my God, we could go on a deep dive about the law of attraction <laughs> and manifestation and that uh, distorted style of thinking, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, number 13 is the fallacy of change, which assumes that other people should change to suit our interests. 14 is the fallacy of fairness, the belief that everything in life should be applied um, equally. 15 is heaven's reward fallacy, which basically states that if you are good, then good things happen to you. If you're bad, bad things happen to you because God. Mm -hmm. So those are the 15 cognitive distortions. <laughs> there are just so many good ones in there. <laughs> 
so many good ones. It's really hard to pick favorites. I know. What are your what are your like most visited cognitive distortions? The ones that come up for you the most. Okay. The internal control fallacy I struggle with for sure a lot, which is the belief that a person has complete control over themselves and their surroundings. This belief assumes you're responsible for the pain and happiness of those around you. If someone is unhappy, they will assume it is their fault. An example in my own life would be, I don't know, saying, honestly, this happened when I got hit by a car. I immediately thought I was in the wrong and I was just going straight through a green light and somebody was trying to make a left turn and like T-boned me. Mm -hmm. And my first instinct was, I'm bad. I'm wrong. I caused this. How could I? I should have looked. I should have been better. Yeah. this I could have prevented this when you couldn't have. Well, the funny thing is the other woman who was 100% in the wrong, and by the way, I had to pay no money. Like, I completely won the case and got extra money for it. She got out of the car, and having her external control fallacy firmly locked in place, she started yelling at me, saying that it was my fault. She was blaming And in this example, you could say that she thought she had no control over what happened. And she felt that everything was externally caused in this situation. Meanwhile, she was not looking where she was turning left. Okay, I'll list one more favorite and then you tell me yours. Should statements. I think these can be really sneaky. So a should statement, this distortion are statements like you must do, you should do, or you shouldn't do. And often these are very subconscious things and a dialogue you're continuously having with yourself. So it's like rules that you enforce on yourself and then subconsciously other people of how people should act in the world. Mm -hmm. And you impose like a unrealistic set of expectations usually. Mm -hmm. And this causes, of course, anger, resentment, guilt, just bad feelings all around. (laughs) But my therapist once pointed out to me, I had said something like, I don't hang out with people on like Monday and Tuesday nights. And she was like, okay, why not? I was like, I don't know. I just, it's a rule I have. And she's like, what other rules do you have? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I was like, what do you mean? It's not actually a rule. And she was like, well, it sounds like it's a rule for yeah. you. And then we got into over several weeks, this idea of should statements and rules that I had subconsciously put into place and accepted as the norm. Mm-hmm. And it was so helpful to unpack my thinking and understand how I was trying to use you know, these expectations of myself or other people to control situations. That's so good. I was just thinking like the, these 15 things, if you just took these to to a therapist for a year and worked on all of them, damn, you could hit probably like <laughs> everything major in your life that has come up for you. You know, that's, that's a really good one of like, investigating and interrogating what societal expectations or like, where did you learn Mm -hmm. the rules that you have in play? And are they still viable? Like, is the game still playing or do the rules not matter anymore or do they not work for you? Because so many of them are sneaky and so many of them are culturally formed or maybe from your family or religion. Yeah. I used to have a, a very similar rule to your Monday, Tuesday. I don't go out those days when I was starting holisticism. I just didn't meet people at night. Like I, I was like, I'm, I'm working on thing. And then I was like working all the time. <laughs> and I, I was like, I really need to like date and make friends. And that was hard to like make that transition. Cause I hadn't even really realized that I was doing it, but I was like treating my week, like a school, like school nights. And it totally worked Mm -hmm. for a period of my life where that was all I wanted to do. But then that rule no longer applied. So I like that. You're reminding me of of times in my life when that's been true for me, too. What about you? I mean, all of I'm I'm guilty of all of these times a thousand. Like I'm totally, totally a catastrophizing person, both escalating quickly. Like, for example, I often and this is also anxiety, but I often go okay, the dog is in the cage at home. What if there's a fire? What if our electricity, like what if we have an electrical fire and she's stuck in the house? Do I have the neighbor's phone number? Do they have my phone number? Would they call me? Are they home? Would the fire department get there? Do we fix the batteries in the fire alarm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the smoke detector? 
to the point that like I've stopped an appointment. I've, I like had to leave a massage because I was like, I need to go check on my dog. And I know in those moments that like, okay, we need some help, bud. That's not healthy. Like that's a bit extreme. Um, that was like the week before I got married. I was so stressed out and (laughs) I was like trying to chill and Mm, I just simply could not, but that comes up for me a lot. Um, a lot, a lot. And it used to also come up for me. Actually, it's probably still does minimization of either what I've done or things that have happened in my life, just kind of as like a, a way to survive. I think, I don't know. I think sometimes if you really sat with everything that was going on with you, like I've had to do a couple intakes recently with like, I'm, I'm getting a new psychiatrist and I'm starting with a new primary care physician and kind of explaining what was going on in my life and what I do and sort of like my day-to-day stress. It's like, oh yeah, it is kind of like a lot, I guess. <laughs> if, if you like write it all down on paper, like there's a yeah. lot going on. Um, but to like sit and it doesn't necessarily feel good to me and, but minimizing it doesn't make me feel better. And I think that that's the thing about these cognitive distortions, just because there's not like a, here's how to fix it. It's just a, here's that you might be doing it. And there's plenty of ways to try and sort of like pull yourself back from these distorted styles of thinking or, or tactics, I guess, that can make them more manageable. The other one that I do, I mean, I do all of these so often. Yeah. I really used to, like, the fallacy of fairness was a really big one for me. Like, it's not fair that mm-hmm. rich white men have all the power. It's not fair that people who work really, really hard remain in poverty. It's not fair. Like, they're, the scales should be righted or, like, For example, I've had some really, really abusive bosses that were women. And for a long time, I was like waiting for karma or something to like get them, you know, of like, well, yeah, eventually they'll get theirs. Like, and I do sort of believe in the spiritual law that what goes around comes around, like that eventually how we impact the world around us, like we will experience in some way. But I don't think that it's like, it's one for one necessarily. And I don't think that we'll always see, like see someone be reprimanded or like for their actions. And that was a very, very like hard for me, especially like experiencing like being hurt by those people or being bullied or abused by those people for such a long time. Like you want them to get their comeuppance and you want to see it and you want it to happen in public. But that also like eats away at you and that's distracting. And my life improved so much when I kind of was able to like take this cognitive distortion and be like, yeah, sometimes like bad people, good things happen to them (laughs) and like they never get their comeuppance in this lifetime that we know of. And like, you kind of have to be okay with it. Just move on. It's tough because the fallacy of fairness really dovetails with the heaven's reward Mm -hmm. fallacy. And especially in pop culture, like most messages in our media are still reinforcing both of those fallacies Mm -hmm. that justice will prevail. So the fallacy of fairness is constantly reinforced in most popular films Mm -hmm. that we see have those Mm -hmm. endings and the same with heaven's reward fallacy, because ultimately it's, you know, I guess it's, better to believe that if we do good, good things will happen. Therefore, more people will hopefully be doing good. But the problem really is when you're relying on this versus it just being a bonus that it worked out Mm -hmm. well. And I think these are some of the trickiest ones because everywhere you turn, it is constantly being reinforced. That's such a good point. I think that's why true crime is so popular because often it's like oh yeah justice is served even like cold cases 50 years later we can find them and you know we can put a period we can like we know the end of the story and of course inside of us we don't feel like whole and complete until we know the answer we feel like oh that thing came back around for that person who did that nasty thing but in reality that we don't experience that in life like Rarely. And if we're just waiting to feel whole and complete for, I don't know, for a period to be put on the end of some of our stories, you're not going to live your life, you know? It makes me think of, to a degree, the desire and wish for closure Mm -hmm. in any type of relationship ending, friendship, work partnership, or relationship where 
if it feels like there wasn't a sense of closure for one party, that there's such a desire for that. And sometimes the seeking of that from the other person pushes maybe the other party further away. And it's the cycle of seeking closure when maybe that doesn't exist. Yeah. Or the closure is not going to come for 20 years. And that's why we say life is long. You know, don't, don't rush. If you really are like looking to close the door on a relationship, I don't think that you can rush that. Also like read Sacred Contracts by Carolyn Miss if you really are struggling with a relationship and getting over it or moving on. Um, I think that that's a great book, like a great framework to work with. Okay, that dovetails into the last one that I wanted to bring up, which is 13, The Fallacy of Change. This thought distortion assumes that others should change to suit their own interests. So the person will pressure others to change because they feel change will ultimately bring them happiness. And they are convinced that their happiness is dependent on another person changing. Mm -hmm. And I think you can read this and be like, no, nah, I don't expect that of people. I'm, you know, on the surface. But this one, again, is sneaky because I think if we're invested in self-development and growth, we often even subconsciously think that everyone else is mm -hmm. too. Even if they're not reading the books or listening to podcasts, we think on some level they must be interested to a degree because it's something that is so important, blah, blah, blah. And I think I've experienced this most and the hardest transition with family mm -hmm. where you think that, let's say you start going to therapy, you start communicating differently and you're like, well, because I'm trying different things, they're going to do different things or they're going to act differently or they're going to change because this is supposed to help do that. And so sometimes you're, you know, taking on a new role in the hopes that another person in your family will too, so that you can complete this, you know, evolution. And sometimes that happens, which is amazing, but most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> it's really hard to accept. Yes, that is such a good point. As you were saying, it was like, oh yeah, this is family. You know, it's wild. I learned this. This is the biggest thing that I learned when I went to Landmark. So I went to Landmark Forum, mm. Potential Cult, when I was 20. I worked at Lululemon. I'd worked there for a year, and they sent me. And it did a little bit fuck me up because for some reasons I'm going to explain. But this is one of the main things that I learned. Like, I can't make people change. I can't wait for, like, my sister or my boyfriend or my best friend or my parents to be who I want them to be to love them. I need to just love them now or, like, decide to be in relationship or not with them now, not sort of like waffling and moving the goalposts all the time. And at that time I was dating someone who was also a dancer. We were both really poor, you know, we were just young and he cheated on me a lot. Let's just say that. And when I went through landmark, I was in this moment where we'd been dating for like probably two years. I was like, should we break up? Like, what's the point of being together? Like, we don't have any money. Like if we want to get married at some point, how are we going to do that? Like he needs to get a real job. I don't know. Like we need, I, I can, I don't trust him, blah, blah, blah. And for better or worse, Landmark taught me like, if you're going to stay together, you just have to accept this person for who they are. And I probably like accepted them a bit in a toxic way of like, I should have stood up for myself, right. but it really changed our relationship. I do think for the better, even though I say that because it made our time more enjoyable together. <laughs> and ultimately, like, that relationship didn't work out. And he did cheat on me with probably, like, 25 different people all over the world. Ugh. I, like, internalized that lesson a little too much. But I've been able to come back from it and not be so extreme about it. And that was actually life-changing for me to not always expect other people to change for me and to just accept them for who they are in the moment. It's actually very freeing when you do that, when you're able to do that, because you realize how much almost psychic pressure you've been putting on this relationship. Mm -hmm. And there's an energy there that shows up in all your interactions that even if the other person doesn't know what it is, they feel it. And it's kind of like this really nice release when you're able to do it. Yeah. I will caveat that it comes and goes with family. <laughs> yeah. Because it, I think it asks, at least when I do this for myself, I have to ask, do I actually love this person or do I love the potential of my life with this person? If they change to be what I want them to be. 
And that's not actually love because that's conditional or that's conditional love. And that's not necessarily what I'm going for. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be really hard with family because you can be like, actually, I don't know if I love you. Like I'm related to you, but, but I don't know. If, I don't know if I love you. <laughs> you know, that's tough. Tough, tough stuff. stuff. As you like to say. <laughs> <laughs> so we could go on and on about these and they're so valuable. Like Michelle said, there's so many great resources, so we'll link a few, but one of the resources we were particularly loving and referring to is from mindmypeelings.com. It's a blog by this guy, Anthony, and he has really great anxiety and mental health resources. So shout out to Anthony for supplying us with some really awesome reminders about cognitive distortions because this was a great infographic and blog to have and he has great resources so check him out big anthony the mvp of this episode yes he has really great worksheets one of the things that i really like in this article is he does a great description of what cognitive distortions are and links how sometimes a depression spiral can be related to um your habituated cognitive distortion so Anxiety too, as we've talked about a lot, or as I've (laughs) copped to in this episode quite a bit, like clocking these can really help you as you're sort of descending into anxiety or depressive state and be like, whoa, okay, Mm -hmm. let's pull back from this trigger. That's very helpful. Yeah. It was very illuminating to me because, you know, we make fun of and kind of joke about gratitude lists and the power of them. And they sound cliche and often cliche things are cliche because there's truth to them. And I feel like that's a truism, I, I guess, about gratitude lists is they can help you reemerge from some of these distortions and spirals. Amen. And we'd be remiss if we didn't say, if you clocked any of these for yourself, you might want to go talk to a therapist. Therapy rocks. Finding a good therapist can be tough, but it's worth it. And specifically, if you find this type of perspective really helpful and you haven't done CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's so, so helpful for catching these sneaky thought patterns and habitual ways of thinking that, to Michelle's point, contribute to those anxiety peaks. That's true. Well, that's the episode. That's it. (laughs) Here's 15 mental models. Yeah. (laughs) Let us know what you thought of the episode. Please, if you love this, share it with a friend. It helps us get found. And if you're not already a subscriber, we also have a subscriber plus feed where you get an extra episode each month. And we drop a little mini audio course into your feed where we go deep on a topic that you guys have requested or something we're teaching in the North Node. So stick around. Otherwise, we will see you on Tuesday. Bye. The Twelve Plus is produced by yours truly, Wallace Miller Blanchard. Our theme music is made by Nathan McKay, and our wonderful editing is done by Softer Sound Studios, who you can find more information about in our show notes.